Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here live from Davos at the World Economic Forum. Now, on today's show, we continue our live coverage and special guest interviews out of the WEF. In just a moment, we'll be speaking with Poland's Prime Minister, followed by the JP Morgan EMEA Chief Executive. And then later on, we'll also uh, speak to Nigeria's Finance Minister, Zainab Ahmed. Now, on to the guest of the hour with this exclusive conversation from Davos, the Prime Minister of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister, Thank you. for Thank joining you. Thanks us. for having me. I know you have a very busy schedule in Davos. I know a lot of the talk is, of course, about inflation. A lot of the talk is about the economy. We also have... And Ukraine uh, and Russia. And Ukraine and Russia. And we also have breaking news out of the IEA saying that the oil market is facing a bigger surplus even as China's reopening. Now, you have said that you will reduce your dependency on Russian oil, but you have not completely quit it. Can you quit it? We can quit it. We have uh, actually abandoned any imports of um, Russian gas and Russian coal. We've done this within a very short period of time. And together with the other member states of the European Union, we are going to do the same with oil. So making Europe independent of Russian fossil fuels yes. and, and, and uh, re-establishing uh, distorted um, value chains, production chains post-COVID, these are the major yeah. economic challenges of the nowadays. So, Prime Minister, given the energy complex now can you cut off Russian supplies completely yeah we can we can do this we've, we've done but this you with are gas doing it? sorry are you doing it we, we are can. we are doing this and we are going to do this together with the other countries of the European Union because this is what we have decided several months ago uh, on our European Council meeting mm -hmm. uh, and the important thing is to do this uh, together um, just a couple of more headlines, of course, from uh, that uh, IEA saying that the oil market facing a bigger surplus even as China reopens. So welcome everyone who's listening on radio or who's watching on TV. We're with the Polish Prime Minister. Um, Prime Minister, when you look at, you know, I guess the, the energy complex going forward, and also you have talked very tough on Vladimir Putin because of his war in Ukraine, what are you expecting the EU to do next? Are you pushing for more sanctions packages, or 10 sanctions I am, I am, because this is the, the only way how we can end this war in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a peaceful and uh, stabilizing manner. I, I just fear that Russia will be successful in their uh, invasion and then uh, the whole of the European Union is in trouble. So uh, the only peace which, which will m uh, mean stability for the future is when Ukraine survives, Ukraine's sovereign and territorial integrity is, is maintained. So this is why the sanction packages uh, started to bite uh, yeah. Russia. Yeah first couple of months you wouldn't see this but uh, but now right now uh, the Kremlin has to count with the sanctions packages and we are going to work on the 10th uh, sanction package right now how soon do you think we'll get that um, over the next couple of weeks I hope there is a meeting between the EU and Ukraine the beginning of February and the, the, uh, thereafter we have a meeting with uh, within the European Council and uh, I think we'll be closing this in the month of February um, Prime Minister Bloomberg yesterday our editor-in-chief spoke exclusively to the Chancellor of Germany Olaf Scholz who said he's speaking to allies with allies to send some leopard battle tanks to the ground you have 14 of those tanks have you spoken to Germany and will you send I them? spoke to uh, Olaf as well several weeks ago Ago, I, I, I try to encourage um, him uh, and Germany to do more because uh, Germany with their policy on dependency of, of, uh, on, of gas um, uh, Russian gas uh, created uh, lots of uncertainty and instability uh, in the first place so they should now feel more responsible to support Ukraine. Their policy back then was Wandel uh, durch Handel, change through the trade. And now they, they should take bigger responsibility. They should um, help uh, with weapon delivery to Ukraine even more. And I try to persuade Olaf to do so as quickly as possible. But uh, do you have their support to send your 14 tanks? Will, yeah, will we, those 14 we, as, tanks we go? Said, as we said, we are, we are making our, we, we earmarked our yes. um, 14 14 Leopards uh, tanks and now we wait also for uh, Leopards from Denmark, Finland, Germany 
and f uh, tanks from the other countries of the European Union because we wanted to mm, inspire others to, to actually gather more tanks uh, to, uh, to have um, potentially uh, 60, 70, up to 100 of very modern tanks which can make a difference in, on the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, Prime Minister, how difficult is it to, of course, go very hard on Russia uh, without making Vladimir Putin think that it's so bad that he would use nuclear weapons? Is this a serious threat? I don't think so. Everybody has to count with this, of course, because nothing is beyond our imagination. But on the other hand, I don't think it's, it will happen. Um, here, even China was very much on our side and saying to the Kremlin, to, to Putin, don't do that because this would mean a completely different world. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on this very critical aspect which you asked. Uh, how difficult is it to keep Viktor Orban close? being friendly with Viktor Orban, given his it stance wasn't easy, on Russia. It wasn't easy, <laughs> but we, we managed on all those sanctions packages. He could have blocked this uh, because sanctions have to be agreed uh, unanimously. And um, every now and again, I had to talk to Prime Minister Orban, uh, to Viktor. And uh, so far, whatever you say about, about Hungary, we are not happy with their position towards Ukraine, but he never blocked sanctions on, on, uh, on Russia. Uh, Prime Minister, you've also been locked in dispute with the, the EU on the disbursements of these 35 billion right, euros. How is that going? How is that progressing? I think closer and closer. We are, we are closing all the uh, contentious uh, topics. And I hope that over the next couple of months we will be there with our RRF, with the next gen EU. Uh, right now we are doing fine even without it because we, would, we, have, we have started all the projects related to RRF with our own money because of our very stable budgetary situation. We were able to not only gather money for RRF projects, but also, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, you, if you're, you're aware of this, but our expenditures on defense might be the highest in yes. the in the NATO, in the whole of NATO. Yes. Yeah, you're also facing elections uh, this year. The, the highest in terms of GDP, G yeah, comparison capita, to GDP, yes. of course. But, uh, you're you're also facing elections this year. How later difficult? On this year. Later on this year, how difficult is it to to continue with fiscal spending as we get closer to the elections? Um, fiscal expenditures and uh, stability of public debt and so on, these are not major challenges for Poland. I know they are for many of our partner partners, for other member states of the EU and other countries. This is because we, were, we managed to repair the public finances and we, we, ex we spend more on, on uh, military expenditures, social expenditures, at the same time keeping budget deficit in check. Um, Prime Minister, how, how, I don't know if it's a concern or whether you're worried that there's a too much optimism in Davos, that we spend maybe too much time talking about the U.S. debt ceiling and maybe not enough on energy, the complex and Ukraine here in Davos. I don't hear too much optimism here in, da in Davos. I, I, I realize that many people have fear of recession this year, yeah. potentially even beginning next year. Inflation, as you asked, critically important topic and stability of, uh, of supply chains post-COVID and so on, re-establishing those near shoring, near sourcing. These are the topics here in Davos. And I think Poland and Central Europe is, is, is very well located to be a pivotal in this um, re-established order of the business models of many, um, um, many Western companies. Thank you so much, Prime Minister, for your Thank time you. today. Thanks that was, of course, me. the Polish Prime Minister. He is Mateusz Mura Wyszki, and of course, joining us for an exclusive conversation. Now, we'll have plenty more from Davos throughout the day. Some of our other guests speaking to us in Davos. Here they are. Stay with us to hear from the biggest names in global business, including the Blackstone CEO, Stephen Schwartzman, a little bit later this morning. Coming up, more interviews live from here. Don't miss our conversation with the GP Morgan EMEA Chief Executive Viswas Raghavan. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Francine Lacroix here in Davos. It is a cold Davos. I know I got many messages on social media saying how cold is it exactly. So I'll be a weather girl from time to time and telling you it is minus 9 Celsius 
It is cold. Let's get to another great conversation here at the World Economic Forum. Joining me now is the JP Morgan EMEA Chief Executive Officer. He's Viz Raghavan, also braving, not the wind, but certainly um, the bitter cold. Viz, thank you so much for joining us, me, as ever. You. It's great being back in Davos with so many Wall Street banks being back, uh, financiers gathering around, and we haven't been here for, for three years. What's the mood like? It's difficult to gauge whether it's too optimistic or too pessimistic. Look, I think first of all, it's great to be back because what you know, it's been three years since we all got yeah. back together. So it's been it's it's really good seeing people, clients again. Um, the mood is mixed. I mean, it's it's it it seems like a Davos where everyone admits we are in flux. Um, there's clearly we had some good signs on you know inflation kind of yeah. finally you know the, have you seen the you know the the end of it? You know, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah. Is there a reversal coming? You know, I think interest rates are all kind of gone up you know so the era of abundant cheap money is gone you know now finally there is a supply constraint there's a cost of capital so companies treasurers are all reworking you know the whole cost of capital model but I would say you know there is optimism um, but you know our base case as we plan yeah. for our year ahead is a is a modest recession yeah. uh, a mild one but clearly you know when you're a man on the street, it, it you know it doesn't feel that yeah, way. Yeah. It certainly doesn't. What does it yeah. mean for the banks? So when you look at compensation bonuses, and certain you know parts of the industry did great, others saw a bit more pressure. What kind of conversations are you having? I mean, look. I mean, last year wasn't great for you know if I if I split the businesses between kind of investment banking and markets. I mean, the investment banking. I mean, we've talked about it before. You know, it's been a pretty anemic year in terms of volumes, etc. So, and. All the banks pay for performance, so if the performance isn't there, so the compensation isn't going to be there. Uh, on the market side, it's really been, you know, uh, selective depending on asset class. So commodities, uh, rates, macro uh, had good years. Credit, I mean, it, we've charted the course for some time, so credit has been very mixed. And then equities, volatility, desks have really done well, whereas you know you've seen little by way of conviction buying. So cash equities has been kind of uh, more more muted. So in terms of compensation, I mean, and, and U.S. We think that U.S. bonuses will will be down. Europe no, will no, be the same. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's you know the performance hasn't been there. So, I mean, it's not even a. Uh, and people under, understand. I mean, this is kind of you know if the performance isn't there, it, you know, you don't expect it. Yeah. So you don't. So you don't worry about talent, you know, retention or leaving ship or anything like that, because it's. A, is I, it across I, the board? No, I, I don't think so. And and generally, where at times like this, when you're at J.P. Morgan, you have the flight to quality. You know, it's yeah. a it's a you know, it, what business is happening? You know, yeah. we 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 do end up partaking in a lot of the activity. Uh, but really, I think uh, the pay for performance yeah. culture doesn't go away. So. Um, talk to me a little bit about whether you know some of their staff needs to move around. I know you did a, a push, for example, into Paris, uh, into France because of Brexit. Does that continue, or is it on halt? I think we've attained our steady state as it relates to Brexit. We were we were very early, and so a lot of the moves that had to be done, you know, they have, they have happened. And I, and I, you know, it's nicely settled now. I think you know we have all the folks wherever we 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 need it, and and I think. It's it's working, you know, uh, pretty well. Um, in terms of our investments, though, I think clearly, you know, Chase International has been a uh, a big push for us. So we continue to hire in the UK. So so in the UK, we still have about you know in excess of eighteen thousand people. So it's still a lot of critical mass. Is the UK stabilizing? So it's interesting to you know not see the prime minister, not see the chancellor here, but there is a shadow chancellor. There is a the the uh, shadow prime minister, the Labour leader. Yeah. So look, I would I would say. The UK is feeling the same kind of the economic kind of cross currents that pretty much every major nation, G7, even emerging markets, you know, they all, everyone is feeling the same uh, cross currents. But there's a bit of a kind of a nuance in the UK, um, and I would say the nuances are clearly there is a um, a kind of a, an economic Brexit impact, which needs to be replenished, and and that is work in progress. Um, unemployment is good, so the rate is low, at around three and a half percent. But the workforce, you know, the labor force participation rate yeah. is really low, yeah. and you know, and, and that and, and that's true of the United States as well. You know, a big chunk of the workforce simply hasn't, you know, returned to work, and I think that that needs to improve. And then finally, I think it's fiscal policy, yes. and, yeah. and and actually, our equity strategists uh, have the UK among their top picks. Yeah. Purely from a valuation point of view. So, notwithstanding these kind of these little idiosyncrasies, 
we, you know, if you take, you know, there are some fantastic companies, um, multi-currency earners, Sterling cost base, um, and, and I think there's real kind of, there's real valuation yeah. uh, upside. Does it feel better to, to be in the city of London? Because we, it feels like the Sunak government is trying to take care of the city a bit more with, you know, for example, the stopping of ring fencing and things like that. Are, are they taking notice? Have you had meetings with them? Yeah, we do, and I think it, it, the, the partnership between, you know, government, treasury, the financial institutions, uh, and the whole financial, so it's, it's always been very, very good, you know through the financial crisis, you know, through COVID. I mean, it's, it's very iterative. It's very hands-on. Same with the regulators. I think they do a, a fabulous job. And, and they are kind of really managing within the, the constraints yeah. that are imposed on them. So, you know, so in terms of activity, you do what you are able to do within the kind of the framework, so. Is working from home over? Look, we have, most of our people are back in the office. I think, it, you know, it's, it's, there is a, you know, there, there's a there's a spring in people's steps. I think it's really good having people back. So uh, I'm not sure it's over, but I think the hybrid format it will every, you know every organization will will discover their own kind of formula, and I think it'll bed in nicely. So Viz, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah. Of course, that was the J.P. Morgan EMEA Chief Executive Officer Viz Ragavan. We'll have plenty more, of course, throughout the day. Coming up, what does it mean to be contrarian when you have 1.3 trillion dollars of investments? The chief executive of the Norwegian Wealth Fund, Nikolai Tengen, tells us that interview is next, and this is Bloomberg. Chief Executive Officer of the Norwegian Wealth Fund, Nikolai Tangen, made an appearance here in Davos and he told us he would like to send a message to the chief executives, encourage them to avoid corporate greed. Now, Tangen told us what is changing in the fund's investment philosophy. Um, contrarian, of course, means to try to do the opposite of everybody else, and um, that's where all the money is. I mean, if you are, if you are right in a contrarian way, you will uh, do much, much better. And that's kind of the philosophy we try to installed increasingly amongst our traders and our portfolio managers. What does that mean in terms of specifics here? What is sort of the common thought that you would lean against? Well, I thought it was much easier last year to be contrarian because it was, it was clear that, you know, with so much negative rates that there was one way they could go. Um, a lot of people selling out of the integrated uh, oil and energy companies, you know, that seemed like a, a good place to be. Um, and um, equity is at a high level. Now I think it's much more difficult to know what contrarian is. Uh, there is uh, less of a clear trend and there is less of a clear positioning in the market. You mentioned energy equities, which did incredibly well, which led the rally that we saw last year, and yet you have a complicated relationship with fossil fuels because it is your mandate not to invest in companies that have big uh, carbon footprints. How have you managed a rally that a lot of people say will continue at a time when that kind of goes against some of your mandate? Well, since the, the, the fund is, is based on, on revenues from oil and gas, the, uh, the parliament decided that we should not invest in pure upstream oil companies. So, what, but what we do do is to invest in the integrated energy companies, and I think that's a good place to be. They are, play a very, very important role in the in the energy transition, and uh, and so we continue to have big investments there. Have you increased allocations on this wager that they are going to have an even bigger role as people realize that it will take fossil fuels to get to the other side that people think of as a cleaner energy future? Well, just for the moment, we have we have pretty e equal weight there. Going forward, a lot of people are talking about a potential downturn in equities. We had Bob Prince of Bridgewater on yesterday talking about a potential 20% decline and an earnings bubble in stocks. Considering that you are such a big investor of public equities globally, how are you playing this? Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, you know, I think it's the first time that I've seen such potentially very different outcomes. I mean, normally I have one strong view here. I think there is a potential that the whole thing could muddle through. And the reason for that is because people are already so cautious. There is so much talk about recession. And typically, uh, you know, the market wants to do one thing. It's to steal your money. And the way it could steal your money now is actually to go up. Having said that, I think the big, big uncertainty this year is what will happen with global inflation when China kicks in. Uh, I think it will be inflationary. 
and there is a risk that we could see an acceleration of inflation again on the back of that, that would be really bad for markets. Well, what would be the diversification that could help from an investor standpoint in that scenario? Well, so the problem in that kind of scenario, you're not going to make money anywhere. So, um, you know, if that happens, you will lose mon You will probably lose money in the in the bond market. You lose money in the equity market. You lose money in the um, in the real estate market. So do you? I, I just don't think there is any place to hide there. What about cash? I mean, are you increasing some of your cash just to sort of be nimble in a situation like that? No, we don't really. We we uh, it's not really in our mandate to have a lot of cash. We are uh, fully invested. It's kind of a, a fraught moment then, if you think that everything could potentially do very badly. Well, we, you know, we are a very long-term investor. We invest with like a 40 to 100 year time horizon. And so we have to sit through some of this, this volatility. Uh, that's, that's life. A lot of the Norges Bank Investment Management Chief Executive Officer Nikolai Tenga. Now coming up, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says he's confident his country can avoid a recession this year. We bring you that exclusive conversation next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Davos. Now, Olaf Scholz has offered reassurance that Europe's largest economy will avoid a recession despite facing an energy crunch amid Russia's war in Ukraine. Well, the German Chancellor sat down exclusively with our editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, in Berlin. I'm absolutely convinced that this will not happen, that we are going into a recession. And uh, we showed that we were that we are able to react to a very difficult situation. I think no one really expected that we mm. would easily survive a situation when there would be a complete stop of the supply of Russian gas to to Germany and Europe. And but we succeeded with uh, all the decisions we took to 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 fill our storage capacities with gas. That we put twenty coal plants back to work uh, in producing electricity in using the Norwegian and gas and the Dutch gas and in using the capacities of Western European plan, uh, ports and building new LNG ports at the northern shore of Germany. And the first one was opened in the end of last year after 200 days of work. The next one last week and the third to come will be opened the next week. But do, do you think, Chancellor, that that is enough for next year? It, Europe has avoided a gas crisis, this, an energy crisis this year, partly because of the provisions you talked about, partly because of the rather nice warm weather, although Berlin seems to be an exception at the moment. For all those reasons, we've got away with it this year. Next year, do you think that you can get through without blackouts? You're giving up nuclear power. You're giving up a lot of that gas that you had this year. I'm sure that we will be able to go th through the situation again. And this is because we are constantly increasing our capacities for uh, importing gas uh, from the northern German ports. And this will not stop with the things we did already. It will continue. And uh, we will build a capacity that gives us a chance to have as much gas as we had uh, before uh, this war uh, and are able to import it without importing gas from Russia. Well, that was the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite in Berlin. Now, later today, we'll also hear from the European Parliament President Roberta Metzola. So don't miss that conversation. Of course, it's a huge one, not only on spending uh, Parliament, some of the scandals that we've seen in Brussels, but of course, a big conversation on Ukraine. Now, the business and financial elite are in Davos here to discuss urgent global issues. And earlier, we spoke to the State Street Chief Executive, Ron O'Hanley. He told me what his outlook is for 2023. It's still early, I think, to, to say that it's, that it's all over. Um, I think that it, if you think about the United States, I mean, you still have a, a, a very, very tight labor market in most uh, areas. Uh, that tends to provide inflationary pressure. Uh, you've got uh, the situation in China uh, with COVID, and we just don't yeah. know if that will result in any kind of, uh, of production problems that will become inflationary. 
you still got a lot of fiscal stimulus that's working its way through the system uh, and will result in at least, uh, what, what it'll have good impact, things like yeah. the Inflation Reduction Act, but in my mind, it's too early to be optimistic. Uh, and then lastly, and maybe most importantly, yeah. there's a lot of geopolitical risk out there. Uh, and we don't know what's going on in Ukraine yet in yeah. terms of what that outcome will be. And by the way, in the United States, uh, the potential yeah. for a debt ceiling fight. Yeah. How do you, so first of all, how do you view the U.S. debt ceiling issue? Is this something that could turn ugly? If we talk about the 24th hour, could we go into the 25th? And could we even see a U.S. downgrade? Yeah, um, the idea that we're even talking about this after what we've seen in the past, uh, to me, is very disappointing. Um, this is about uh, money that we've already spent, money that we've already borrowed, and that we need to actually honor that. So this is not the way uh, a political fight should occur. I think that markets have not priced it in. They don't typically do until it gets very close. Um, and But it would be catastrophic if this got pushed through to a actual, we're not going to pay our bills. Um, Ron, we also had the keynote speech from the vice premier of China mm -hmm. yesterday, and then a few select financiers got to meet him also privately. Were, were you given assurances that China is reopening in the right way? So I think um, I, I'm actually optimistic about China. I think the Biden administration has done very good work with, the, uh, with China. Um, I think there's a recognition that while there could be some select decoupling and there needs to be, um, if you think about chips and things like that, I mean, these are, these are two major trading partners and China is an important trading partner to the rest of the world. So some of the uh, personnel moves that apparently have been made in China I think are strong signals. So um, again, it's far from over and uh, it's not the situation that we enjoyed you know, back in the uh, mid of the last decade. But I, I'm more optimistic about that from a geopolitical perspective. Right. Well, that was the State Street Chief Executive Officer Ron O'Hanley speaking to me earlier. Coming up, we're live in Davos for the World Economic Forum. Don't miss Manus Cranny's interview with Nigeria's Finance Minister Zainab Ahmed. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Davos. Now we're just getting some breaking news from the Aramco chief executive who has arrived in Davos and is speaking to reporters. He's saying that there is spare capacity in the oil market, but that is too low. He also said demand is actually uh, picking up on the China and aviation recovery. He was also, for example, discussing with our people here on the ground uh, chemical investments with many Chinese firms. So on the one hand, opportunities because China's reopening, but uh, I guess he says there's not much of an oil buffer because demand will pick up. This is what he's saying in uh, China and also aviation in general is picking up. So we have a lot more conversations to bring you today. The Manus Cranny is here with a guest and you also talk oil. Manus. Francine, yeah, interesting comments from Aramco and that's per capacity. Let's see, does that shift the oil market? It's relevant to Nigeria, it's relevant to the budget, it's relative, relevant to oil production. The finance minister knows a thing or two about squaring the numbers. It is Zainab Ahmed. She joins me now. Minister, welcome to Bloomberg. Welcome to Davos. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Let's get to growth. Uh, the mood music has shifted a little bit more optimistic from the people that have sat in your seat. Nigeria is expected to grow by 3.75% this year. That's a bit ambitious, isn't it? What are you going to deliver in a tough year for 2023? Well, for 2023, we're looking at a growth of 3.5%, and we're looking at closing 2022 around the same number as well. We're still waiting for our last quarter report to, to come out. Uh, growth has uh, slowed down a bit in the third quarter of 2022, and therefore we have had to moderate our, uh, our year-end projections to reflect that, that decline. What's going to drive 2023 for you? If you've had to moderate in the Q4, what drives, what drives this year forward? What drives uh, 2023 forward is increased revenues from the non-oil sector mm -hmm. and also uh, the beginning of the pickup of revenues from the oil sector itself. 
I, I'm sure you know that we've had some problems regarding production, mm -hmm. and um, but the production has uh, picked up, and it's going to. It looks good uh, to continue to reach the numbers that we have put in the budget. So we hope. So to what, do, what do you think? What do you think Nigeria will produce in terms of oil this year? What's realistic? I know Melikiari is going after the oil thieves. What can you deliver in terms of oil production? Our target is 1.6 million barrels per day. And that comfortably achieve that? That, that we can comfortably achieve that. We're about 1.25, 1.3 now, average of. So we should be able to reach that. And hopefully we, we surpass that as well with the measures that have been put in place. Look, you're in full electioneering mode. And the election is hot on our heels. Would you say your party has done enough to win re-election? Inflation, it's a global problem, but that's doubled. Growth has slowed to just an average of 1.1 per cent from 2015 when you took over. You've done enough to convince the public to put you back in office? We have done a lot. We've done a lot in terms of taking care of the people, increasing our infrastructure stock, holding the economy to grow on a consistent basis. Despite two recessions, we pulled out of recession quickly and set the country back on the path of growth. We've also done a lot in terms of being able to provide for our people at the time that people need. Uh, help the most. But the, the accusation back to that, that, that political narrative is that debt and debt sustainability um, is probably the single biggest issue. Nigeria is now spending 80% of its revenue on debt servicing last year. IMF reckons that's going to break 100%. That is not sustainable. You've not got a sustainable debt trajectory. Well, 80% is not sustainable, and our plan is it's, bring, it's coming down to 60% in 2023. And how are we doing that? We're doing that by increasing revenues and by reducing, significantly reducing costs to enable us uh, cope better. But that's going to hit the real economy, isn't it? If you've got to pull costs out, that's going to hit the people on the ground, well, the very are, people you said you're defending. There are some costs that we can pull back on mm -hmm. that will not hit the economy, but there are some costs that we must sustain, such as uh, provisions for education and health, as well as infrastructure. So you would defend robustly that you're in a sustainable debt sustainability. I, I just, I'm struggling with that. We are sustainable in our debt trajectory. We have made our plans to make sure we're able to consistently service our debts. And by the way, we're also exiting for a subsidy, which is a huge cost. I'm part of the contributors to where we are in terms mm -hmm. of this, the, the, the debt stock. So once we pull the, the, the first subsidy out, uh, production of crude oil increases, and then we sustain the improvements we have put in place in terms of non-oil revenue, mm -hmm. then we should be able to come down to 60% uh, uh, um, uh, debt to revenue. Does that open up the bond markets for you again? If I look at the yield movement, the current yields, are they low enough for you to consider a euro not, bond issue not, this year? Not, not 2023, no. You're not in the bond market 2023? No, not 2023. What do yields need to get to for you to think, yes, we're back in power, I can get back to the bond market, international debt market? If we're able to get back to the rates of uh, early 2021, then we can consider going back to the bonds market. But then we are consistently monitoring the bond market. We are monitoring the performance of our bonds. So when it gets to that comfortable level, we'll explore it. But liquidity, how... how how big an issue is liquidity for you? Is it getting tough? Is it getting tight? It is tough. It's an election year. It's also a year where we have planned um, a census in April. Mm -hmm. So those are two very large spends that we have uh, early, early in the first quarter of this year. Look, under President Buhari, the bill for running the country is at $50 billion. I, I want to deal with this in a couple of different ways. That, to many people, is something which is just very unsustainable. Are you talking to the World Bank, to the IMF, any multilateral agencies about any help or relief on your debt? Um, we have been able to get support from the World Bank, from the IMF, mm -hmm. during the COVID. From the IMF, we got support uh, of the SDRs. So we have two rounds of SDRs. That had helped us uh, a great deal. Also, is there more to come? Are you in active negotiations for more? So there's this general negotiation about another round of SDRs. We are part of the group that is asking for that, and we do hope it comes because it will benefit all of the emerging economies as well as the low-income uh, countries. How close are you to a significant announcement on, on that from the multilaterals? Could it be before the election? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. So we just want to wait and see what happens in the spring meetings.
if I look at the currency side, you know, we talk about liquidity be, being tight. So out of the bond market, a currency which has uh, dropped by more than 10 percent, many EM currencies have had the same tough time. Is it a deliberate move by the government to embolden that weakening of the currency? Well, it is a plan of the Monetary Authority, and uh, it was planned carefully and, and uh, implemented. Uh, most people even say slowly, but we are where we are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, of course, what happens to the U.S. dollar affects us as well. Of course. Yeah. And the, the dollar has come off from, from, from its peak. Is it time to dump those multiple exchange rates? I mean, it's cost you $144 billion between 2017 and 2021. Is it time to dump and run on the multiple exchange so rates? So right now we have one formal market, the NAFEX, mm -hmm. where trading is done. And that is the rate that we use for official exchanges as well. So if I get any dollar inflows, that's where it is monetized as well. Any outflows I have is monetized also at that uh, I and &E, &E window. So we have only one window that is an official window. I mentioned $50 billion, the, 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 the story that we wrote yesterday on, under President Buhari. Now, many people talk about the ways and means advances from the central bank. Your government is now asking the National Assembly to convert that, that debt and part of that debt into a bond to be repaid over 40 years. The question, politically, I suppose, and from markets is, is that legal? And what do you say to the critics of that, of that strategy? It is legal. It is legal. Uh, and we couldn't do it earlier on because there was limitations as provided in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. But in the 2021 Finance Act, we actually made an amendment that is enabling us to do that now. We could have done this earlier. But is it politically palatable to ask the country to pay this bill? It is the necessary thing to do, and it is the right thing to do. We don't want to leave this for another administration to uh, come and do it. So what we have also is a situation where this will provide significant fiscal relief because it's bringing down the cost of uh, servicing the ways of means very significantly. Minister, unfortunately, I'll not be there for the election. One of my colleagues will. It's my one opportunity to get to Nigeria, so hopefully you will invite me uh, across the rest of the year. Thank you for joining us on Bloomberg. That is the Minister of Finance you, uh, readying herself for, for the me. political campaign. Francine. Great interview, Manus. Thank you so much, Manus Cranny. They're talking about Nigeria. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, throughout the day here from Davos. Also, you can log on to LIV Go. You can watch a really stellar panel with Bloomberg's Jackie Simmons moderating the panel on banking in the eye of the storm. Now, speakers there, and you can see, of course, some of them, the UBS chairman, Colm Kelleher, city chief executive, uh, Jane Fraser, Singapore senior minister, uh, Tharman Sanmu Garatnam, and the Central Bank of France governor, of course, François de Gallo. Now, coming up, we have plenty more on interest rates. The ECB reportedly on course to slow rate hikes from March. The Bank of France governor thinks that could be unjustified speculation. We'll hear from that exclusive Davos interview next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Davos. Now we're just getting some breaking news out of Ukraine. We have two big pieces of news we need to bring you. First of all, the Serbian leader is marking his distance from Putin, saying that Crimea is Ukraine. Now, this is something that uh, seems surprising uh, to many, something that we need to monitor, whether there is, of course, a fault line where uh, some allies that have been previously very close to Vladimir Putin are now either taking their distance or certainly not supporting him as much as he used to. The other big piece of news that happened just in the last 10 minutes is a Ukrainian interior minister has been killed in a helicopter clash. Now, for the moment, investigations are ongoing on the ground. We don't know whether this is foul play or not. We know that the interior minister and at least 17 other Others were killed when a helicopter crashed near kindergarten, um, of course, just east of Kiev. Now, we'll have plenty more on that throughout the day. Also, let's get to the Bloomberg Business Flash with Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne.
Hi, Francine. China's top economic official says the world's second largest economy is on track to rebound this year to its pre-pandemic rate of growth. Speaking at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Vice Premier Li He said coronavirus infections have likely peaked following the lifting of most COVID curbs. The Chinese economy grew 3% in 2022 at the second slowest pace since the 1970s. Now, the UK remained the world's biggest exporter of financial financial services in the first year after Brexit, but the US, which is in second place, is now catching up. According to the lobby group, the City UK, the country's surplus from the sector was $87.2 billion in 2021, up about 8%. The surplus recorded by the US jumped from the previous year to more than $85 billion. Now, the Bank of Japan has doubled down on its stimulus defence, pushing back against speculation of policy change. The BOJ held its negative interest rate at minus 0.1% and 10-year bond yields around 0% and said it would continue a large-scale bond buying. Its updated forecast suggests officials still don't see inflation staying above 2% over the coming years. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Bloomberg has learned that ECB policymakers are starting to consider a slower pace of rate hikes after a likely 50 basis point increase in February. But the Banque de France governor, François Villeroy de Gallo, says it is premature to make specifics rate forecasts for March. Well, we spoke to him earlier for an exclusive interview. Activity is more resilient yes. than expected, and we should avoid recession this year, probably. And second, inflation will very probably peak in this semester, first on handline and then on core. Uh, but we must stay the course in our battle against inflation. I'm very clear about that. We will win this battle. Let me be extremely uh, straightforward, Francine. We will bring inflation back towards 2% by the end of 24 or 25. Now, Governor, so you believe basically we should reach the terminal rate by the summer? and then hold. Is there a worry that if, if you, you know, go interest rates up too high after the summer that you overshoot it? I don't think so. I cannot yet say where the terminal rate will be, but I think we should be there by, by summer. Uh, and uh, to put it in a nutshell, last year was about speed, the sprint. Uh, this year is more about a combination of level and duration. Uh, and it, it's very important also to say that afterwards we will stay at this terminal rate as long as necessary to bring yes. inflation back towards 2%. Uh, Governor, yesterday we had a story mm. by Bloomberg, a Bloomberg mm. scoop, saying that some people in the Governing Council believe that there should be a 50 basis points rise in February and then down to 25. Is this the right way of looking at it? Uh, I, I, saw, I saw this story. Uh, frankly, Francine, I was quite surprised. Uh, we said very clearly we will decide meeting by meeting. We are data driven, so it's much too early to speculate about what we will do in March. Uh, let me remind you of the words uh, of President Lagarde at her last press conference in December. We should expect to raise weights at a pace of 50 basis points for a period of time. Well, these words are still valid today. But again, we are pragmatic. But the next shoe to drop is a decline. It has to be a decline in the economy, and in particular, a contraction in labor markets because the core issue with inflation is wages. We expect to see a mild recession, um, largely driven by the painfully persistent service inflation. I'm absolutely convinced that this will not happen, that we are going into a recession, and uh, we showed that we, were, that we are able to react to a very difficult situation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. No change from the BOJ. The Bank of Japan pushes back against market speculation that is changing policy. That's led to big drops in the yen and bond yields. 
You can count on the ECB continuing to raise interest rates in half-point steps. That's the word from the Bank of France chief, Francois uh, Villeroy, a member of the governing council. And more big tech job cuts on the way. Microsoft is expected to target engineers today, while Amazon's cuts focus on retail and human resources. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. And plenty of news still being created on the slopes of Davos then at the World Economic Forum, Kayleigh. But overnight, the big market story uh, coming really from Japan. Yeah, that was absolutely true. Broadly, it was an up day in Asia, but far and away leading those gains was Japanese equities. The Nikkei 225 was up a substantial amount, about 2.5% after that BOJ decision in which they did absolutely nothing, which defied market expectations. Traders really had been betting on even a further pivot from the Bank of Japan in regard to yield curve control, and yet Kuroda and the board maintained it. So you saw a big move in Japanese assets. Obviously, the move in Japanese stocks was driven in large part by the weakness of the Japanese yen. At one point in the overnight session, the yen was weaker against the U.S. dollar by 2.7%. We have reversed some of that move, but still it's weaker by a full percentage point. Right now trading at 129.48. And then in the bond market, we saw that 10-year JGB yield, which of course is capped at 50 basis points by the Bank of Japan, dropping down to as low as 36 basis points. We did see some uh, recovery off of the lows of the session, ultimately ending the day down by about six and a half basis points or about 46 basis points overall for that yield. So we didn't get the move from the Bank of Japan, any real policy pivot from the Bank of Japan today, Matt. The question is, when might it be coming, especially with Kuroda's term up in April? Yeah, exactly. And how much uh, more can they afford to be buying J JGBs. Take a look at U.S. futures. We're looking at gains, but they're very muted gains after a tiny drop yesterday. In the cash trade, we were down to 39.90. So um, close to that 4,000 level, and it looks like if we get gains today, we could overcome that. The 10-year yield coming down a little bit, so offering less competition um, to stock yields off five basis points to 349.59, so coming in under that 350 level. NYMEX crude has risen, and in fact, commodities across the board are rising on a weaker dollar, so right now 81.52. That's West Texas Intermediate, not Brent. So we start to really see a climb in commodities across the board. Gold not to be left out, up about a quarter of a percent right now, $1,913 a troy ounce. Anna, what do you see in Europe? Yeah, a pretty mixed picture, pretty flat picture. Waiting perhaps, Matt, for more clues from the Fed, more clues on the China reopening story and the earnings story. We're in limbo on those three, perhaps, and we uh, we wait uh, to get more detail. Also, perhaps, watching what's going on with those conversations taking place in Davos. The inflation narrative continues to, to develop, and we just got confirmation of the euro area. Uh, final reading on December consumer prices rising 9.2%. That's exactly in line with the preliminary number, the estimate of 9.2%. So no change, not much to see then on the European inflation front, except for the the fact that 9% is still a very high level, of course, for inflation. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. One stock specific to point out, ASM International, uh, a Dutch chip-making business, not to be confused with the also Dutch ASM L, which is the company that is much, much bigger and makes lithography machines, but it is a chip maker and it has produced some numbers that the market seems to be digesting very positively and some analysts saying this could set quite a positive tone for the sector, which has been hit by some disappointing earnings readings recently. Brent crude up by one and a quarter percent to echo, Matt, what you were saying, moving steadily higher. $87 is where we trade on Brent crude. The market's live team talking about long positions being taken in that market. The pound at 123 is the handle there, up half a percent. The CPI data out in the UK today, 10.5%. That's a down from 10.7%, but in line with estimates, sent the pound a little higher, still underlining the double-digit inflation challenge that the central bank is facing. And 108 on the euro, on uh, euro dollar, up another 7 cents of a percent after a drop yesterday. We'll get more details on this, uh, but this after reporting by Bloomberg yesterday that we might see a step down from the ECB February into March. A little bit of pushback from the Bank of France governor today on that front, and so the euro goes higher, Matt. All right, we'll continue to watch um, the ECB. Right now, though, I want to get more on the BOJ. Bank of Japan Governor Haruhiko Kuroda reiterated his view that the stimulus framework is not under threat. He also commented on the yield range. There is no economic reason to expect the 10-year JGB yields to continue trading above the 0.5% band. I don't think the Bank of Japan needs to widen the 10-year JGB trading range as the bank is continuing to manage market adjustments through the nimble use of YCC and fund supplying operations. Bloomberg Kathleen Hayes joins us now live from Tokyo. So Kathleen, what are the key takeaways? Are they just going to keep buying bonds if the market pressures them? 
Well, they're going to have to, aren't they? It's just interesting how one camp was so correct and one camp wasn't. Clearly, the economists and other uh, former policymakers, et cetera, who said, no, this, this is not time for a change from the BOJ. They just did this YCC yield curve control adjustment four weeks ago. Why would Crow to move again so soon? Uh, and it, it's, it's just not likely, certainly not at this meeting, and maybe not before he steps down uh, as governor of the Bank of Japan. Traders, though, and I can, we can all sympathize, right? Hey, come on. They, when they did this adjustment, bond market went crazy. They've been forced to buy billions of bonds. A, a new record bond purchase is set uh, every day, it seems. I'm exaggerating a bit there. But clearly, Governor Kuroda did not have that intention. He has not taken the first step toward normalization. And he made it clear in so many ways in their policy statement. It was reiterated at the press conference. They're going to continue large-scale bond buying. Uh, they're going to purchase bonds on a flexible basis as needed. Uh, they still don't see inflation in 2023 or 2024 getting up to 2 percent and staying there. So it's, it's pretty clear that uh, this was not the kind of first step, uh, or at least the first step towards the first step towards exiting YCC, starting to exit stimulus. Uh, and it seems that, if, if anything, we're, that another message, I think, is that uh, this is what he's doing for now. He's kind of keep the boat going smoothly as he can. And if they're going, definitely they're going to have to buy more bonds. And do you think that's a problem for the Bank of Japan? Haven't they showed us, but now that they own more than half of the government bond market in Japan, that they could they'll buy bonds as they have to? They have and they will continue as long as they have to. Well, Kathleen, it begs the question then, if they're not moving now, what happens next realistically? When would that next move happen? Well, first of all, I'd like to kind of put our focus on this, the, their loan provision uh, program to commercial banks. They basically charge them nothing to borrow money that they can then use for other things uh, to buy securities like government bonds. You get a guaranteed return and it's, it's riskless. They've now said, Corona said at the press conference that he wouldn't rule out going negative, that rate going negative. That's how they determine they are to keep this steady. Next, governor. I think that's the story. Uh, we'll, hear, we'll get the nominations in uh, the first part of February. Governor Crota's last press uh, uh, meeting is in early March. Uh, he steps down in April. The new governor's ne first meeting will be the end of April. That's what we're waiting for. I think this is all just, as I said, keeping things going, uh, b keeping the, the ship uh, afloat, and the next person is going to have to take over. This will be big decisions and potentially disruptive when they do end while yield curve control. Let the next guy do it. Corot has gotten the ball rolling in a way. It's up to the next team to, to carry it through. All right, Kathleen, thanks very much. Bloomer's Kathleen Hayes reporting live from Tokyo after the BOJ decision. Now on to the ECB, where policymakers are starting to consider a slower pace of rate hikes. But the ECB governing council member Francois Villaroy de Gallo says it is premature to make specific rate forecasts for March. Francine Lacroix spoke to him exclusively in Davos. Uh, let me remind you of the words uh, of President Lagarde at her last press conference in December. We should expect to raise rates at a pace of 50 basis points for a period of time. Well, these words are still valid today. But again, we are pragmatic. But Francine Lacroix joins us now uh, from Davos. We cut you okay. off there at your butt, Francine. Uh, it doesn't look like he was having it, right? He doesn't want to speculate on no. what's going to happen, you know, two months out. Yeah, he had one message when he came on Bloomberg, and it was, we're data dependent. It was funny. He actually sat down, Matt, and he said, just a reminder to everyone, I'm not a bird. I'm not a hawk. I'm not a dove. I'm data dependent. And from there started the conversation of how he saw it developing. He says it's absolutely too soon to commit to anything in March, but he says, go back to what Christine Lagarde said. We need to continue fighting inflation. And the way he sees it, first of all, he wouldn't be drawn on where markets were wrong or not, but actually you're aggressive. You're quite aggressive from now until the summer to make Make sure that you nip it and that inflation goes down and then you pause so there's no talk about an ECB pivot there's no talk about uh, possible rate cuts this is you need to do it strong you need to do it now get to the terminal rate probably by um, you know the, the beginning of summer or midsummer and then you, you kind of cruise through to give everyone a chance to recuperate what's interesting and is that he didn't give me a terminal rate. he says we just don't know where that is yet so they're monitoring mm. the situation 
OK, Francine Lacroix in Davos, thank you very much. She'll be back later this hour, of course, uh, with an interview with the Standard Chartered CEO, Bill Winters. Lots more coming from Davos this hour, in fact. Uh, sticking with the macro themes, UK inflation dipped for the second month in December, falling further from a 40-year high. UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says he has more to do to bring down the cost of living. Today's figures show is that there is no room for any deviation from our central objective of the year, which is to halve inflation so that we deal with the anger, for example, of public sector workers. Bloomberg's uh, UK reporter Lizzie Burden joins us now with details. And, and Lizzie, take us through the, the headlines, if you like, from the inflation print. Well, so you're seeing inflation dropping for a second straight month. It's clearly on the downward trend. It's probably past the peak, but it's still five times the Bank of England's target, still in double digits. What's driving the fall is prices at the pump, but you still saw food prices increasing actually at the fastest pace on record and also services inflation on the rise again because businesses are passing on the cost of higher energy and higher labour costs. And we saw that in the jobs data yesterday, wages rising at the fastest pace, excluding the pandemic in November, but still not keeping pace with inflation. So on balance, the sticky the stubbornness of inflation is going to give ammunition to the hawks on the Monetary Policy Committee. Markets currently split between a 25 and 50 basis point move from the Bank of England in February, but economists increasingly changing their calls to a half point hike. And as you heard there from the Chancellor, cutting inflation a key priority for the government because it keeps on fueling the strikes. But the bigger question for the Bank of England is how fast this decline will continue throughout 2023 and at what point, unlike the ECB, the Bank of England can pivot to cutting. All right, Lizzie, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden there rounding up our uh, macro headlines. Let's get to some company news now. Microsoft is joining the ranks of tech giants that are scaling back. Bloomberg has learned that company, the company plans to cut jobs in a number of engineering divisions today. And this comes as Amazon is also set to kick off a new round of deep job cuts. Alex Webb a Bloomberg Quick Take joins us now for more. So we continue to see these job cuts in tech. Um, Microsoft looks like it's not so deep, but Amazon is uh, going a little bit deeper. Well, yeah, the Amazon is the job cuts that we already knew about. They are kicking off today. The job cuts at Amazon are, as you say, a lot deeper than those at Microsoft. We don't have hard numbers on the Microsoft numbers yet. It's from uh, reporting from our colleague Dina Bass in Seattle. The thing is, if you look at the stats, Microsoft doesn't have the need to cut uh, headcount quite as drastically as Amazon might. Amazon's revenue per employee, which is the number you get if you take the total revenue and you divide it by the number of employees, it's quite a good metric for how efficiently the company is run. Its revenue per employee has declined quite considerably compared to the number pre-pandemic. Microsoft, its number, revenue per employee, is still above that number pre-pandemic. It's dipped a little bit in the past few months. So it's maybe doing a little bit more fine-tuning around the edges rather than Amazon's deep and relatively hard cuts, at least for a company of its history. All right, Bloomberg Quick Takes, Alex Webb, thank you so much. Now we'll look at some other company stories we are following this morning with stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. United Airlines, one of them. It is guiding for the first quarter earnings to be more than double what analysts expected. United saying between 50 cents and a dollar a share. Analysts were only expecting about 22 cents. So that's a pretty big blowout, and it is all about pricing power because demand is still strong and supply is still constrained. So that stock is up about 3% before the bell. Another stock moving higher is Moderna. It released the final stage uh, study for its RSV vaccine yesterday. It prevented more than 80% of cases. So that paves the way for the company to get its first approval outside of COVID-19 related products. So that stock is up nearly 6% before the bell. Uh, and finally, one more stock moving to the upside. This is earnings related interactive brokers. It reported after the bell yesterday, topped expectations. The stock getting a reward as a result. It's up about 3% in early hours, Anna. Kaylee, coming up on the program, a host of interviews from Davos this hour. We'll be speaking to the Bain Capital co-chairman, Steve uh, Pagliuccia. We'll also have the Standard Chartered CEO, Bill Winters, and Blackstone CEO, Stephen Schwartzman, with us. Plus, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz thinks a trade war with the U.S. is unlikely. Look for our exclusive interview online or on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm sure it will not happen. We are working very hard to, to avoid a situation like this. And uh, yes... We are very much appreciating what is the basis of the decisions of uh, President Biden and uh, the Congress saying that they are willing to invest into 
a better future, which is more looking for environment, climate developing climate friendly industries, which I very much support. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York, Anna Edwards with us out of London. But we want to get back to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Bloomberg's Lisa Abramowitz is there with Bain Capital co-chairman Steve Pagliuca. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. I'm Steve Pagliuca here with us uh, after 34 years at Bain Capital. Co-chair, you went there uh, as you looked for some cash to subsidize your business school and never looked back. What are you doing now? What are you going to do now that you're going to retire? You're stepping down. That's a great question. It's been, been only a day now, so maybe you can give, <laughs> maybe you can give okay. me some counseling. Uh, no, I think things will remain for the short term pretty much the same because there's a lot of projects to wrap up. Uh, I'll become a senior advisor to the firm, and I'm just so thankful to be with such a great group of partners for so so long a time. I'm, I'm uh, overwhelmed by it. Uh, fantastic. I, I've been working with the same folks for, for close to 30, 30, 30, 35 years now. When you look back at more than three decades, is there a deal that you maybe passed up that you kind of regret that you wish you had uh, hooked into? Yeah, you, know, you know, I always believe you, you kind of can't look back. You always look forward. Um, the the uh, uh, maybe I should have bought some Bitcoin. I never I never got into that, but that turned out to be a good thing recently. But that <laughs> well, had, that had a great run. And one thing, uh, Adam Silver, the chair of the uh, NBA, said that he doesn't believe that you ever will retire. That you are not somebody who will ever stop moving or working, and that you send him messages at all times of the night with suggestions. You do own the Boston Celtics. You are interested in the Chelsea football team. Didn't win that bid. Are you looking to? push further into the football arena. Absolutely. We, uh, football is a fantastic sport. You, you know, th there's been a whole sea change in sports in general, which we benefited from, in that it's gone global. And the two global games are basketball and soccer slash football. And as you know, we, we purchased uh, Atalanta up in Bergamo, not, not so far from here in the mountains. And uh, I was fortunate I was able to go Sunday before I came here to the game, and, and we won 8-2. to two. It's the most goals that Atalanta has ever scored in the history of the franchise. So it's been a really good week. So maybe it was, you know, your presence. I am wondering. I don't think so. I think it's because we have good players and great, great coaches and great managers. But on the, in, in London, are you planning on bidding on any additional teams? You know, I, I'd have to kill myself if I told you that answer. But yeah, we, we are our group is looking at many teams. Uh, the prices have gone up very high. And, you know, we, 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 we want to buy a great club, but we want to stay disciplined so we can invest in the club over the future. And so my fear is some of these prices are, are now getting so high that, that there might be disinvestment, and I, I want to have a great club, and I want the club to be able to win, and you got to be competitive. So you have to budget putting money in to make it competitive. You're leaving behind private equity, or you're not leaving behind private equity, because you're not actually leaving, because you're going to be an advisor to the firm for the next decade or potentially more. Uh, but you're transitioning in a real moment of transition for private equity. Do you think that we've already seen the peak for private equity, as perhaps we've seen the end of low rates and that entire era? Uh, on the first question, absolutely not. Uh, private equity is is it only in the first stages right now. Um, you know, I got into it in in the in the late '80s, and it was a cottage industry. It was mainly located in the U.S. Um, didn't even have to travel that much, and there were very few firms doing it. Um, by the way, there, there I don't think there were even cell phones you know back then. So it was, it was a whole it was a whole new whole new world. Um, but what's happened is, uh, and by the way, the, the the reputation the industry got was they would buy overcosted companies and take costs out. That was in the 70s. Uh, by the time I got there, there was competition, and now there's lots of competition. So the real focus of private equity is to build and grow great companies. People want companies that are going to grow. So, that, so I think we live in a, in a world where people think to the old days when it started. Private equity today has developed huge value-added global services, has taken companies and, and lifted them and transitioned them into becoming great companies. And that's how you really build and, and, and actually make money for your investors. So what kind of victimhood or carnage do you expect to see from the fact that a lot of people think that we haven't seen the reckoning in private equity prices from what we've seen in public markets, that we haven't seen the reckoning of what the true value is for a company that grew up during 0% rates that now is facing 4 or 5%? Well, that's a great question, Lisa. And I think the reckoning, the good news is the reckoning is going to be more of reckoning on tech companies 
um, and, and and let's say you know, you know kind of new internet tech companies that people were saying it, this this thing the Amazon model worked. We lost money for 20 years, and all of a sudden we made money. Now that's the exception that proves the rule, and 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 so. The companies, the private equity firms that went heavily in that direction, paying 30, 40 times revenues, which, you know, was astounding me. Uh, uh, that's where you're going to find the reckoning. But the rest of the portfolio is pretty well. The United States has low unemployment, so people are employed, um, people are spending money. So we're not seeing a diminution in those non kind of speculative tech companies, and, and thankfully, Bank Capital, we haven't done very many of those. Do you expect returns to come down because people are more disciplined with their cash and aren't necessarily as willing to go into high-risk moonshot investments? Um, that's a relative question. If you, if you look at private equity returns, uh, uh, most firms are shooting for 18, 20 percent rate of returns. And when, when uh, one of your compadres asked me this question, in 1993, saying, I asked you this question in 93, 2003, 2013, and now 2023. Basically, they say, there's too much money in 93, too much money. The, the industry has, has gone 10 times up in money chasing too few deals. You can't maintain those returns. Well, we've maintained those returns now for, for every decade for 40 years. Why is that? It's because the private equity model works. It puts, it puts capital work with experts that really help drive these companies, and certainly Bain Capital. We were built to help companies. We came out of a consulting firm. We didn't come out of a finance firm. We came out of a consulting firm. And we spent 30 years refining that, becoming having expertise in, in vertical markets, medical, technology, uh, financial services. And so we add that value to the companies. Uh, we, we, we invest heavily ourselves in the companies. Our, our, our firm uh, has like 10 percent, a billion dollars in our, in our, a billion two in our $12 billion fund, we invest behind the companies. So that aligned model, a long-term approach, and then value added both on, on, on vertical markets and now functional expertise, we bring in a digital marketing team, we bring in a, a finance team, uh, has made it a very viable model and you're seeing it taking share from the public markets. So I think we're only in the, still in the early innings and it has another you know, 20 to 50 years to run because it's a great business model. And you can see it being 18 to 20% uh, in that period of time as well. A absolutely. It's consistently done that for, for 40 years now. What about in China? What about some of these other areas that a lot of people are pushing into and seeing a lot of uh, value? Is Bain as well? Well, we, we, we've had a, a, a fantastic uh, Asian presence for a long time now. We're one of the first people into Japan, for example. So we have a Pan-Asia fund. We now have over 50 people, professionals in Japan. I think the largest operation in Japan. And Japan's a fantastic market because uh, they are now embracing capitalism. Uh, I met with the prime minister about a month ago. He's, he's pushing that. They've got to rejuvenate the economy. They believe it, 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 they've got to have more free markets and more capitalism. And we've been fortunate because the Japanese really respect a company that's trying to build value and sticks with Japan. So we never went in and out. We, we went to Asia. We stayed there. We built a large presence. They love the value-added approach. So we've done large transactions like Kyokusha was Toshiba Memory, uh, Hitachi Metals. Uh, and you're seeing the market open up there. I, just, I was just actually on well, Okay, just 10 seconds, yeah. 20 seconds. Yeah. Do you think that they're going to drop yield curve control? Do you think that that will be actually beneficial for bringing in investments? You know, things don't happen quickly in Japan normally. Um, and I, my, my, my father ran a company there in 1973. Um, you know, and I tell them, you've got to go from a thousand year time frame to a hundred and then maybe we can get to 10. So I'm not optimistic that will happen. And, and they have a heavily indebted economy, yeah. so interest rates really hurt, hurt the government thing there. So it, it'll be a slow rise, I think. Uh, Steve Pagliuca, I wish we could have more time. Steve Pagliuca, congratulations on your tenure and on the next chapter ahead, which will be, I'm sure, very busy. Back to you, Anna. Thanks very much, Lisa Abramowitz there with uh, Steve Pagliuca in Davos. Coming up, we will head back to Davos. We'll be speaking to the Standard Chartered CEO, uh, Bill Winters. Lots more to come from the, uh, from the uh, Davos World Economic Forum. Coming up shortly, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. No change from the BOJ. The Bank of Japan pushes back against market speculation that it's changing policy. That's led to big drops in the yen and bond yields. You can count on the ECB continuing to raise interest rates in half-point steps. That's the view from the Bank of France. The governor speaking to Bloomberg.
And more big tech job cuts on the way. Microsoft is expected to target engineers today, while Amazon's cuts focus on retail and human resources. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines over in New York. And Matt, I'm not sure if everyone's just watching our coverage from Davos or they're watching the tennis in Australia, but yeah, European equity markets, little directionless this morning and US futures not much better. Thank you for reminding me about the tennis. I will definitely tune into that as soon as possible. In terms of markets, there is nothing going on in futures. We were down two tenths of 1% in the cash trade yesterday, and now futures are unchanged. So it does look like the markets are waiting for something to decide direction. If it were the bond markets, that would be a positive move because investors are pushing the yield down more than six basis points right now. A 348.67 is the level on the 10 year, and that provides less competition um, to the S&P yield or whatever index um, you're buying. NYMEX crude is is moving. There's a lot of action in commodities. Um, this on the second day of rallies after the call uh, that we got over the weekend out of Jeff Curry saying that, you know, China reopening, um, avoiding recession in Europe and central banks slowing down with rate rises is great news for commodities. This is WTI at 81.55, not Brent. So it's really gotten uh, high above that $80 level. And gold continues to climb over 1900 right now, 1912, only a small gain, two tenths of 1%. But as the dollar weakens, these commodities are worth more. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, one of the big ones to focus on this morning, Matt, is United Airlines, which gave preliminary results for the first quarter and full year, giving that guidance after the bell yesterday, handily topped analyst expectations. For that fiscal first quarter, analysts were expecting profit of about 22 cents a share. United comes out and says, no, it's actually going to be more than double that, between 50 cents a share and a dollar a share. So that stock is up about 2.7%. This is really still a pricing power story because capacity remains constrained. Yes, United says they are expecting to expand capacity this year, but still supply is coming up a bit short of demand that remains really strong in the aviation space. So that allows the airlines to keep raising fares, unfortunately, for all of us that have a lot of flying to do. And as a result, you're seeing some trickle through to other airline peers as well, not gaining as much as United, but American is up about one and a half percent, while Delta Airlines is up by about a percentage point. Finally, one big outperformer as well to note today, is Moderna, a stock we all know very well because of its COVID-19 vaccine. But of course, this company is trying to create a future for itself beyond that. And the latest product that it is attempting to do so with is its vaccine candidate for RSV. It released the final stage uh, study results for that candidate yesterday. Highly successful. It prevented uh, infection in more than 80% uh, of those included in that study. So as a result, that stock is up about 6% before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, European equity markets then just up a tenth of a percent, so uh, lacking direction, as I say, but either side of the flat line really on European stocks this morning. ASM International, the smaller uh, tech business uh, compared to ASML in, in, uh, ASML in the Netherlands, both Dutch, both operating in the tech space. Uh, this is the smaller one, but it did come out with some numbers today that pleased the market up by 9%. And some of the analysts talking about how this could set a more positive, different tone for uh, semiconductor manufacturers. So watch that one stateside. Uh, the pound at 123.44. Yes, the inflation print in the UK came down from 10.7 to 10.5, but that's still double digits. It wasn't below estimate, and so perhaps continuing to pile pressure after the wages data yesterday on the Bank of England, and so the pound is higher. The euro at 108.60. Yesterday, the euro fell. Expectation that perhaps we get a step down in the pace of hikes from the ECB. Today, the story is different. Pushback against that narrative from the ECB, Kaylee. All right, well, of course, we had that uh, ECB interview at the World Economic Forum in Davos. So let's go back now to another newsmaking interview. Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua is standing by with the Standard Chartered CEO, Bill Winters. Francine. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaylee. I am delighted to be joined by Bill Winters here of Standard Chartered. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Business How's business? Good. Pretty good? Business is good. Business you, is good. I cannot complain. Okay, you cannot complain, but are you up for sale? I, that's an impolite question. Of course not. <laughs> what, what should I ask him P politely? There's of been an not. offer for you. No, Is that no, 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 no. There's not been an offer. There was. Uh, I, I think your colleagues wrote a story that, that there were some sources that said that that uh, yeah. bank may have been interested in us. The bank immediately put a statement out <laughs> saying that they were not looking at Sanders Charter. That's as much okay. as I know about it, truth be told. Okay. Uh, no, this is not something that, that, that we've either uh, engaged with or been interested in. The thing with Standard Chartered is we're actually doing very well uh, all by ourselves. Yeah. So it, it's been a, it's been a bit of a journey to, to get our, our bank to where we want it okay. to be. COVID was a was a pretty material distraction uh, for the business. Obviously, it was a huge distraction for the world. And uh, but everything is on track for us. You know, we we had okay. super strong income growth last year. We had uh, very manageable credit costs. Yeah. We've 
been returning capital to shareholders. But, Bill, consolidation is in play, right? Is it that, should, is that at the be. back of the mind? It should be. Uh, on how you run the bank or not? No, it's not. Uh, we're, we're running the bank to maximize value you know, for a lot of reasons. Okay. One is that's the only way to, to run a business. But second is it's really hard to buy a bank. Right? It's, it, there's, especially a bank like us. A lot of regulatory approval is required. Uh, it's quite complicated. But the... Uh, uh, but thematically, yeah, there should be an element of consolidation. But you know, I mean, banks uh, are a, uh, are a, 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 let's call it a protected species well, yeah. by regulators. <laughs> and, uh, and consolidation is hard. So do, if you think that actually now is the right time to, to do some kind of consolidation, what's holding it back? Is it regulators or is it just the appetite? Valuations regulators. are cheap. Some valuations are cheap. So, I mean, I think it's quite logical that the banks in locations that are trading at, at you know, a multiple of book value would be interested in consolidating with banks that are trading at a discount to book value. Yeah. So, yeah. European banks are broadly trading at or below book value. Middle Eastern banks are trading at a significant premium to book value. So, just from a financial math perspective, yeah, everybody should be looking at this and saying, oh, yeah, yeah if you, you know, go back to the classroom and do the, the, yeah. the combination and then cost energies and whatever, uh, you make some money. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not that straightforward. What's your take on China reopening? How, how smoothly is it going to go? And what does it mean for business? Look, it's obviously been very sudden, and the, the impact has been dramatic in the short term. Uh, but it, the country seems to be managing. Uh, the, uh, the, the health system is highly stressed, for sure, but, but isn't overrun. You know, we've had virtually all of our colleagues, uh, my colleagues, have been infected in the last two months. I mean, 90 percent or something like that. Uh, they've all recovered. It's a touching wood and, and very grateful for that. And, uh, and they're fully back to business. So I think this is, I think we're really looking forward to a, a, a good renaissance in China, uh, not just in the second half, but even in the second quarter. So what does that mean, first of all, you know, for the world economy and therefore for some of, you know, the IPOs or some of the deals that you have in the pipeline? I think it means uh, a, 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 a gradual working out of the supply chain uh, constraints that we've had. So we know that a lot of things have contributed to yeah. the supply chain uh, problems, including geopolitical tensions and, and, and the like. Uh, but China's manufacturing challenges were, were part of that. That, that eases, which I think will be a, a good thing for the, the disinflationary impulse as well, uh, which is obviously gathering a little bit of steam. Now, we'll have a separate discussion on inflation. I don't think we've quite beat it yet. Yeah. Uh, so there's some more interest rate hikes to go. But China uh, will be, there will be a big demand pull uh, for yeah. China. So there's pent, pent up consumer demand. They'll re-engage in international travel, you know, probably more in the second half of the year. Uh, and this is going to be a good boost for the, for the global economy at a time when the U.S. and Europe are probably going to slow down. Are, are you surprised? I mean, there's a lot of leverage. There has been a lot of leverage for a long time in the system. And interest rates have moved up quite aggressively in the last 12 months. And we haven't really seen, you know, e either big bankruptcies or yeah. zombie companies. You know, as, as I reflect on this... Uh, I know what you mean by a lot of leverage because aggregate debt levels have gone up a lot, yes. but it's really very concentrated in governments. And uh, the, the corporate sector is actually in, in very good shape, and the financial sector is in extremely good shape. Yeah. So, so banks have probably never been as strong yeah. as they are right now. And uh, this is the reminder that, that, that you know, the credit cycle never dies, but when, when you have a downturn in the credit cycle yeah. and the banking system is strong, you ride yeah. through it. And when you have a downturn in the credit cycle like we did in 2007 yeah. and the banking system is weak, yeah. It's exponential in terms of impact. Yeah. So I'm actually very optimistic that, that we can ride through this. Of course, it's difficult. I mean, yeah. Cost of living was very difficult. Uh, the, the inevitable slowdown in the U.S. in Europe already happening is very difficult. But we'll get through it. But we're hearing also a lot of cost cuts, uh, bonus yep. cuts, compensation yep. cuts, even job losses in, in banking. Is this just a clearing? Of well, I think loss that's, that's very specific to the in, the investment banking yes. deal business. So, uh, which we have, but in relatively relatively small size. The uh, the financial markets or f f you know, fixed income business is yep. booming. Uh, that's been a, a real strong source of growth for the U.S. banks and, and also for us. Uh, retail banking is very strong, so you know, customer delinquencies are actually low. You know, we've come through the COVID period in good shape. Uh, the wealth management products uh, are obviously a very slow sell with such weak equity and bond markets, but we're now at very attractive levels for investors to re-engage. I mean, equity markets have repriced mm -hmm. bond markets. Is it going to get a little bit better or worse? I mean, we're obviously moving around, but we're, we're in a range now. Uh, and for the first time, you could look at a, at a, at a balanced portfolio and say, oof, yeah, I'm, I'm getting some return on my yeah. bond portfolio. I can expect some returns on my equity portfolio. It actually feels pretty good. So I'm, I'm very optimistic for the next year or two, uh, even if right now we're, we're definitely in the, at, the, at the bottom of the trough. All right, Bill, thank you so much for your time on Bloomberg here in Davos. Uh, that was, of course, Bill Winters of Standard Chartered. With that, and I'm going to send it back to you in London, and we'll have plenty more throughout the day. Francine, thanks very much. Francine Lacroix with Bill Winters in Davos, ending that conversation with a little bit of optimism. Not much uh, to say when it comes to the speculation about takeover for his business. When we come back, we will move on. Sticking with Davos, though, we'll speak with the Blackstone CEO, Steve Schwartzman. That's up next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. Let's go, though, to Davos, back to Davos, to the World Economic Forum. Wall Street Week anchor David Weston is there with the Blackstone CEO, Steve Schwartzman. David. Thank you so much, Anna. Yes, Wall Street is here because Global Wall Street here, and you know it is if Steve Schwartzman's here. So thank you so much for being with us, Steve. Well, it's great to be with you, David. Uh, so I think what many Bloomberg uh, audience members would like to know is, what is your larger take? We're in Davos. We're taking a longer look. What is your larger take of what's going on with the economy in the United States and globally? Well, I think in the United States, you know, we're obviously fighting higher interest rates, but we're doing it from the perspective of an economy that's in quite good shape. Uh, one of the reasons for that is an outcome of the pandemic. And, and during the pandemic, people stayed at home. Uh, what, what every country's government didn't figure out is the 90% uh, who kept being employed uh, would end up having way more money uh, after the pandemic uh, because their cost structure uh, collapsed. Uh, they didn't go to movies, they didn't leave their homes, they didn't travel, uh, they didn't buy expensive clothes. And that two and a half trillion dollars of extra money was in the banking system, uh, and they've been spending that money. And that's been keeping the economy performing better than people expected. They've spent about half of it. Whether they spend the rest of it, whether they save it, but that's an extra stimulus, uh, if you will, uh, that's kept the U.S. economy uh, moving ahead pretty well. The Fed, of course, uh, is trying to do something with inflation. Uh, and they have to, uh, assuming they really want to get it all the way down uh, to 2 percent. Uh, so, so they've been very aggressive uh, moving. And the question is, how much effect does that have? Uh, we're starting to see uh, the economy slow down a little, um, uh, and particularly uh, in interest-sensitive areas. One would think it would have had more impact, uh, but it hasn't yet. And the reason we've developed almost a, a two-part economy, uh, interest-sensitive areas um, like housing, uh, where New house construction is down 19 percent. Usually in a recession, it goes down 35 percent. So you can see how far we are uh, away from the bottom. Uh, it's affected Wall Street uh, and markets, uh, because when you raise interest rates uh, very high from a percentage of where you started, it'll have adverse incomes. And there are other parts of the economy uh, that, that, frankly, are still extremely strong, that raising interest rates hasn't affected yet. Stuff like travel, airlines just can't even cope with the volumes. Uh, resort hotels, people after the pandemic were so grateful that nothing worse happened to them, that they just want to celebrate and live life. And anything that touches that kind of personal consumption uh, is doing extremely well, not really affected very much so by the Fed. How does this affect the Blackstone uh, outlook? I mean, you have an awful lot of money that you need to put at work and keep at work and get returns on. Uh, how does a slowing growth pattern and higher rates inform your investments? For example, I know you're very big in real estate. Well, we saw this coming, actually, and started talking publicly about 18 months ago, way before the Fed, about high levels of inflation, because we could see it in our portfolio companies. And what we did is we tried to change what we do to adapt to what we were pretty certain was going to happen in the future. So for example, uh, in terms of an investment area, uh, in the credit space, um, we, we switched all of our investments to floating rate. So we're on the side of the Fed. As they keep raising rates, our customers keep making more and more money. Uh, and they can get up into double digits now with senior secured loans. That's what people used to earn for equities 
uh, and it's pretty easy to do that now. In real estate, we've concentrated in basically the only two areas that aren't being adversely affected. Uh, real estate's an a, a industry with at least six different sub-areas. If you're in office buildings, particularly in the United States, that is an area under enormous stress. 20% vacancies, but that doesn't even count the people who, who aren't going to work. So that's, that's a, an area that is facing real headwinds. Uh, and shopping malls, uh, not so wonderful uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, basically with home shopping. Uh, housing, houses are going down now, okay, in, in value because mortgage costs have doubled for regular people. But areas that are doing extremely well, uh, first of all, is uh, uh, warehouses. We're, we're the largest private owner uh, of rare warehouses in the world. Uh, and that business is, is fighting all the trends. It's up double digits, even in the face of the Fed. Uh, and and uh, apartments, uh, rentals uh, are also doing well. They come down a bit. They're going up somewhere around 5% now. But there's other types of residential uh, rentals that are going up up to about 9%. So at a time there, some parts of real estate are really suffering. And people say, you're in real estate. We're actually the biggest in the world in real estate. <laughs> Something bad must be happening to you. Well, if you really concentrate your ownership uh, in the two good areas, then you know we're having just a fine time in that real estate area. Stephen, what are some of the external factors that actually could affect things? Right now, there's a lot of talk about the debt ceiling and a lot of threats about maybe really tripping that. People think it's unimaginable. Maybe it is imaginable. You've been through this quite a few times. There have been a lot of threats of it. Some people think maybe the Congress is a little more extreme in some respects than it has been in the past. Uh, what do you think is the danger of actually going into default or coming very close to it? And if it were to happen, how catastrophic would it be? Well, I, I can't speak to the political dimension because the House has just formed. And we watched it on television, and it didn't look real functional uh, on the Republican side. Uh, how that will play out, uh, I really don't know. Um, the history has been people use the debt ceiling to make a point. And the point from the Republican side is that we're spending too much money uh, and they want to make sure that their colleagues on the Democratic side understand that. Uh, in actual default, we've been through this a number of times where it's gotten quite close and it's got a variety of really bad effects and you know, particularly with the dollar being the reserve currency of the, of the world which gives us a special status it allows us to issue debt uh, when other people can't you mentioned what the political uh, disunity if i call that in the republican party and you're not a politician you don't involve that at the same time as i recall you did support donald trump early on where is the leadership of the Republican Party right now, and where should it be from your point of view? Well, I said publicly uh, as to the next presidential election that I think we need to move on uh, for both parties. It's a next generation uh, of leaders. Uh, I, I think it's important uh, that, you know, particularly uh, uh, on, on the Republican side, we, we've had a series of four losses. Uh, in a row, the 2018 midterms, the presidential in 2020, the special Georgia election, which actually was in 2021, uh, the midterms in 2022. I think the public uh, has spoken uh, and would like to see a change. Uh, there are lots of interesting people. Anybody uh, you like in particular? Uh, I always like somebody in particular, uh, <laughs> but you don't know if anybody's running uh, at, at the moment. Nobody's declared uh, except the president. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think we wait and see on that one. Uh, but, you know, there's always interesting people. Uh, and, you know, I, I, in my life, you know, uh, people barely had heard of 
Bill Clinton, yeah. uh, he became president. Yeah. Uh, the same with uh, Barack Obama. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, and, and those were all two years out where right. we are now. Right. And uh, so, so I, I'm a patient person. <laughs> uh, you know, experience has taught me yeah. uh, that, that yeah. watching how things right. develop, uh, because there's so much yeah. change uh, in America, is an important thing. Well, that patience just stood you in good stead, I must say. Thank you so much, Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone, for joining us here in Davos on Wall Street Week. And back to you, Matt Miller. Thanks very much, David. Wall Street Week anchor David Weston there with Stephen Schwartzman in Davos. Now let's get back to the markets right now with a focus on calls. Marco Kalanovic from J.P. Morgan, uh, who had for so long been bullish, has stepped down his expectation for equities once again. The question is, will we see back-to-back -back annual losses? They're so rare, as you can see from this chart, if you're listening on radio, I will tell you that it's only happened in a couple of instances over the past 20 years. Um, and of course, we had a big loss last year. So what does that mean for 2023? Joining us now is Nora Melinda, Bloomberg Equities reporter here on set. So Nora, uh, what do you think about the, the new Kalanovich call? He'd already sort of changed his stance la after last year's horrible performance, but now he's saying um, avoid or take uh, take profits if you have any in Europe and in U.S. equities. I mean, yeah, that's really what he's saying. I mean, he's seeing, he said that he sees downside risk for equities within this first quarter. And um, in general, just think, I know we all know that um, he sees a re potential recession, the U.S. falling into a potential recession by the end of 2023. Um, and really just um, looking at in the euro space as well, um, he does. He's pretty much underweight there and overweight in emerging markets and China equities. So it's really interesting here. Well, especially when we compare what drove the downside in 2022 to what potentially could drive it here in 2023, because it was all about the Fed last year. As we are about to enter the quiet period in about a week, is it as much about the Fed this time around? Yeah, I mean, of course we had CPI data earlier this month, but we do have PPI coming out um, later this morning around 8.30 and then GDP to come to follow next Thursday. And I think in regards to GDP, it'll be really interesting to look at the growth aspect of things because, of course, the Fed does want to tame growth. So if we do see significant growth in the G within GDP next week, I think that that'll kind of be a little bit of a sign for us as to what the Fed could be thinking. But that's what everyone's mm. really analyzing and focusing on in these next couple weeks. Uh, Nora, back to stocks. We've had a really strong start to the year, haven't we, for global stocks in particular, certainly outside the United States doing better uh, than within it. What do analysts expect to see? We're heading into earnings season, of course. Yes, yeah, so this week um, it could be potentially poor performance and that actually would not be super different from what history has shown. Um, actually, BTIG has done a study and data has shown that pretty much since 1928, um, in years that ended at least 10% down, which of course we ended further down last year. And in the following year, if the first two weeks we do see a rally, that third week actually we tend to give back some of those gains. Hmm. So if that is something that we do end up seeing this week, it would not be anything different hmm. than what history has shown us in the past. Nora, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Nora Melinda with the latest on the markets. And Kaylee, when we came in this morning, uh, the yen was down by 2.5%, now only down by 9 tenths of a percent. We thought today might be dominated a little bit more perhaps by the BOJ, but as many had warned, expectations were riding too high into that BOJ meeting. Yeah, expectations at least on the trading side. Economists were saying the BOJ is not going to do anything, and they didn't, but it maybe caught traders a little bit off guard that had been uh, bidding for the yen and driving up yields on JGBs. But it is interesting to see some of that first initial move reversing. Maybe they're saying, okay, they didn't do it now, but it's still coming down the line. Yeah, we'll see what comes with the change of personnel at the BOJ later this year. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. Plenty more from Davos. They'll be keeping their eye on the oil markets. Fatih Birol joins the team from the IEA. This is Bloomberg.